So we're joined today uh, by Rich McHugh, who is the manager uh, of the Library's Digital Scholarship Commons and the Session Instructor in the Faculty of Education at the University of Victoria, uh, where they have set up and managed the new Digital Scholarship Commons, the DSC in the library. Uh, they've created and taught extensive blended curriculum workshops on 3D printing, 3D design, Arduino, electronics, data visualization, the Internet of Things, interactive storytelling with Twine, and much more. And Rich is here to, to share with us today uh, some of the experiences that he's had um, through the pandemic and where he's arrived in really thinking about um, some of the different kinds of teaching practices and what, what he's learned over the last two years. So Rich, I will hand it uh, straight over to you. Great, thank you very much. I'll just share my slides here. Quick. There we go. Actually, I haven't used Google Meet for a long time, so I hope that that's showing up on your screen there for you. I uh, just want to mention that I'm coming Perfect. from the uh, uh, from the land of the Lekwungen speaking people on southern Vancouver Island, uh, and my family is originally from southern Alberta, Lethbridge and Raymond, way down south there. I've lived in Calgary for a while, uh, and one thing that would just Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Carrie. One thing that came to mind is we've partnered with a couple of the First Nations here locally uh, in their language revitalization projects and have helped them design and then 3D print fridge magnet letters for their K-12 uh, language revitalization programs to sort of help some of the learners get hands-on with the, uh, the letters for their language and be able to explore and play around with that. So that's been a wonderful thing that we've been able to do over the past year or so. Uh, so uh, just to give you a little bit of background about me, I, as Carrie mentioned, I manage the makerspace here. I've got a background in uh, business. Uh, I've got a business degree, master's degree in education focusing on ed tech, and worked as a systems administrator and project manager for a number of years before working on my master's degree. Our makerspace here at the University of Victoria is housed in the library, and we teach a lot of introductory workshops. Uh, probably 80% of the workshops we teach are taught at the invitation of professors in their four credit classes, and almost always in the support of some sort of upcoming class assignment that they'll need some extra support for, whether it be uh, technical support or just software that they uh, would help them with their, uh, with their assignment. So just a quick outline of what I'm going to discuss over the next few minutes, and I'm going to leave a lot of time for uh, discussion and Q&A. I suspect I'll be doing a fair bit of learning today once we start chatting as well. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Let's see, I've opened up the chat so I can see them there. And uh, But feel free to unmute your microphone and ask, too. This is a small enough group. So. In one of our recent HyFlex workshops that was on uh, using GitHub, uh, we had learners participating from around the world, including face-to-face uh, -face in the library here in Victoria, BC, from across the city here in Victoria, as well as from across Canada. We had one participant from Chicago, Illinois, another one from Lagos, Nigeria, which isn't very common for us, but was pretty cool. And then last participant was from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, we usually give a long distance award for the participant was, who was furthest from us for any, any particular workshop. And I actually had to get out Google Maps to figure out uh, who was further. And just for the record, it is just barely Lagos, Nigeria in this case. But global participation like this is a significantly beneficial side effect of the work that we had to do in order to make our workshops accessible to learners from their dorm rooms during COVID-19 lockdowns. So the COVID-19 pandemic was the catalyst for revamping our makerspace curriculum uh, or makerspace workshops so they could be delivered not only face-to-face, -face, but also online via video conference. Now that we're back on campus, uh, we're offering newly updated hybrid flexible or high flex workshops so that both on campus and remote learners can participate in our active learning workshops, either face-to-face -face in the library or makerspace remotely via video conference, or remotely on their own schedule using fully online self-directed learning resources. 
We initially anticipated that our high flex workshops would be relatively short lived and that we'd return to offering just our uh, traditional face to face workshops. But on campus, uh, our, however, many of our students continue to take advantage of our video conference and self directed workshop options. Uh, which was a bit of a surprise to us because we, we really did expect people to gravitate towards face-to-face. -face. Feedback from learners indicate that this is not only because of COVID-19 concerns, but because HyFlex helps them better manage family responsibilities, help manage mental health issues, and supports out-of-town learners, of course. So during the fall of 2021, once uh, here in v the UVic, when we returned fully to face-to-face uh, -face classes, 82% of our high flex workshop learners for our drop-in workshops participated via video conference and 18% participated face-to-face -face in the library. The registration rates, uh, on the other hand, were probably about 50% video and 50% face-to-face. But many of the people who registered uh, for the face-to-face -face, ended up attending the Zoom workshop when given the option at the last minute. So in our follow-up reminder email, just to let, remind them tomorrow's the workshop, here's some pre-workshop activities for you. We gave them the option uh, or gave them the Zoom link for our workshop. And in the end, instead of a 50-50 split, which was the registration, it was about 80-20. Uh, one thing that I was thinking of when preparing for this today is I, I should dig into the data and see how many of the face-to-face -face people converted over and how many just uh, didn't show up and maybe increased attendance on the, the virtual or the Zoom side of things. But in any case, a lot more people end up participating uh, via video conference. So I've been talking about high flex, and you probably have a bit of a sense for what it is, but I'll just go in a little bit more detail on what high flex is. Uh, high flex is an instructional method that combines face-to-face, -face, uh, video conferencing, and self-paced online learning or self-directed learning. Learners typically can choose how they would like to participate in a workshop given their specific needs at any given time. And this chart gives you an indication of how it might work. With our workshops, which are one-off, typically they'll just participate in one modality. I teach, uh, I'm teaching an ed tech course in the Faculty of Education right now uh, that's a semester long course so students can engage in different modalities depending on what's going on in their lives. And particularly with some people, you know, testing positive or having COVID symptoms, it's been very helpful so that they know that if they don't come to class, uh, they can participate virtually, they won't miss out on anything and they don't feel like they need to come in uh, to participate so they don't miss out and potentially spread whatever bug they've got, whether it be COVID or something else. Or if something comes up, and in the case of my class that I'm teaching on Friday, someone has a medical appointment during the workshop, so they'll participate in that, or sorry, in that class, so they'll participate uh, using the self-directed resources so that they can get the same, uh, same basic experience as the rest of the class. David Rhodes, a HyFlex researcher, recommends that when creating or converting a workshop to HyFlex, to also consider implementing universal design for learning principles to make the instruction as accessible as possible for our, all learners. Uh, it is a fair bit of work to convert a, a workshop or a, a lesson for a class into the HyFlex format, but it's actually not that much more difficult to use universal de design for learning principles when doing that conversion. So we strongly recommend, if you're not familiar with it, to just look into it a bit. And to do the basics is not a big stretch if you're already uh, converting a single workshop or a single class uh, session to HyFlex. Dr. Rhodes also recommends using the flipped learning teaching method where students typically complete some instructional work at home using videos and exercises. And then the face-to-face -face workshop time is devoted primarily to hands-on activities to build on the knowledge and skills that they've acquired during the, the pre-workshop uh, instruction. And what this does, and is really the key thing, it frees up the teacher to assist and guide students who need extra support and help during the face-to-face -face workshop time instead of spending the majority of that time uh, doing lecture-style instruction. 
So we've talked about it a bit, but I'll just go into a bit more detail on why HyFlex. As I mentioned before, HyFlex provides student autonomy, flexibility, and seamless engagement no matter where, how, or when they engage in the course, whether it be for sickness, uh, remote students, or family responsibilities. But HyFlex not only benefits learners, but it can also benefit instructors. So for example, if an instructor can't be present in the makerspace uh, for a HyFlex workshop, they can lead the workshop remotely while students join from the makerspace and via uh, video conferencing. And actually for the past two semesters, our qualitative analysis graduate student expert who's been teaching in vivo workshops for us uh, here in Victoria, her partner got a postdoc position at the University of Calgary. So they moved to Calgary and she has been leading all of uh, her workshops remotely from uh, her, uh, her apartment in Calgary, as well as doing consultations and other things, uh, which uh, has been seamless given the way that we've structured the workshop. So it's been wonderful to be able to have her participate. In my education class, I specifically uh, made sure everything was high flex for this semester, just because I did not know if I'd potentially be unable to attend a class because of COVID sickness and wouldn't want to uh, leave my my students in a lurch or have to call on one of my colleagues to step in for me. But let me be clear, uh, if you're doing high flex workshops, you don't need to include a video conference on option necessarily. And I think this is a misconception about high flex that it's really important to, uh, uh, to dwell, spend a little bit of time on. Uh, it would be great if you can do a video for everything, but especially in classrooms across campus where you don't always have the same technology. Uh, it's not easy or sometimes not possible to use the video conference option. So it's perfectly okay to start out with maybe a face-to-face -face session and then asynchronous self-paced instruction for those who can't make it to the, uh, to the workshop. Um, and this is really, I really recommend using or dropping the video if you, if you don't have easy access to the hardware or if you don't have a, a TA or a teaching assistant to help support the online participants. And I'll go into a little more detail in a minute about why that's, uh, why that's a key point to keep in mind. So if you're thinking about creating a HyFlex workshop, uh, it's central to the HyFlex model is the principle that no matter what instructional path the learner pursues, whether it be face-to-face uh, -face in a classroom or a makerspace, whether it be video conference or self-directed, the HyFlex workshops should lead to the same learning outcomes regardless of the path that the learner chooses to, to take. And the first step in creating the HyFlex workshop or any workshop for that matter is to create uh, learning objectives. And I like to use uh, the SMART learning objectives or the SMART methodology for creating learning objectives. Make sure they're specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. Which if you've done any project management uh, work, that's straight out of project management 101. So for example, for our 3D design and print workshop, uh, our learning objectives uh, start with, by the end of the 3D design workshop, participants will be able to, and then when we have a list of about eight or nine learning objectives, and the first one, so that's the time-based portion by the end of the workshop, which it's pretty easy to be time-bound for a workshop. By the end of the workshop, they'll be able to add shapes and text to the Tinkercad workspace, uh, resize and rotate objects using sliders, and extrude objects or make holes in them, and so on. We've got a number of them there. But just to give you a flavor of what a, a smart learning objective would look like. Another thing to, when creating a high flex workshop would be to initially to work to create a completely online or self-paced asynchronous workshop. Use that as the foundation. Um, and then if necessary, look at the face-to-face -face activities and see if there's any changes you might need to make in those self-paced activities for the face-to-face -face or the video environment. Usually they'll work pretty good, but sometimes you need to modify them just a little bit. Uh, next, uh, look at the instruction. Um, in a flipped workshop, the instruction is easy because it's already uh, online and hopefully 
participants will be able to do that before class. But in the introduction to the workshop, sometimes I'll modify that a little bit uh, to be a little bit different for the face-to-face -face and the video folks than the, uh, the self-paced people uh, would, would have. Usually, again, it's pretty close, but I will tweak it a little bit. And as I mentioned before, we use the FLIP methodology uh, for our HyFlex workshops as well. So we put as much instruction as possible into the pre-workshop assignments so that the vast majority of face-to-face -face time can be spent doing hands-on activities. And I'll put this in the chat. I'll put a link to our 3D design workshop curriculum in the chat just so you can get a sense for what that would look like. And this workshop and all of our workshops are Creative Commons licensed so that you can, uh, if something looks useful or interesting to you, you can use them uh, with that Creative Commons license. Oop. Oh, I just full screen something by accident. Let me just, there we go. So there are some best practices that we recommend for the, our instructors who are leading workshops here in the, in the library makerspace. I'll just go over a couple of them right now. A key ingredient for uh, effective high flex workshops that are taught both face-to-face -face and via video conference is for a teaching assistant to be available to support you as the instructor. And what the TA typically does in our workshops is monitor and support online participants. So they'll monitor the chat, they'll check in with participants, typically via chat, uh, especially during the instructional portion of the workshop when the instructor is focusing on uh, teaching and typically focusing on the people that are present face-to-face -face in our makerspace. The cognitive load on instructors who split their attention to teach both face-to-face -face and video conference is really high. Um, and speaking from experience here, I, I tried to do a few HyFlex workshops solo, and it was really, it's tiring to teach, but you wouldn't believe what it's like. You'd feel like you've been through the washing machine if you try to do it on your own uh, in the HyFlex format. So having a teaching assistant available is, is key for making it work in a sustainable fashion, in our experience anyways. It's even better if the teaching assistant has a bit of background in the uh, in the topic being taught so that they can, you know, uh, answer some of the questions themselves. But even if they have zero experience and are just a, um, you know, just a person who's helping out, just triaging that for you is hugely helpful. In my education classes and the edu ed tech classes that I teach, I don't have a TA. So what I do every class is I deputize one of the students to monitor the chat for me so that I don't miss anything from the, or especially while I'm instructing from the virtual participants, but they can call my attention if, I, if there's a, a question or something that's uh, time sensitive that I need to attend to from the, from the video participants. So during the hands-on portion of the workshop, learners work through the activities that they've chosen at their own pace, whether they be face-to-face -face or virtual. And one thing that I do, especially virtually, but I do this with the face-to-face -face participants as well, I individually check in with, with them. If it's a huge class, which we sometimes have, our I think our record is 3D design and printing for a class of 170 um, engineering students who were, I think it was a electronics class, but they needed to create a case for something they were designing. So it was impossible to do it there, but almost all the time I will individually check in with participants because it's amazing how, how many times I'll say, hey, are there any questions from the class? And it'll be crickets. But if I ask, you know, Carrie, you know, how are things going there? Do you have any questions? You know, they didn't respond to the general call for questions, but if I specifically asked individuals, more often than not, they will have a question or something that I can help them with. And if it's something that I think the whole class would benefit by, I'll get everyone's attention and address it to the whole class so that they can benefit by that question. Um, for the face-to-face -face participants, I'll just circulate through the class and do that individually. But it's great to check in, or it's good practice just to check in periodically with, with the class. It makes them feel more comfortable, and they're more likely to ask questions after, even if you haven't prompted them. So there's a wide range of equipment that can be used to facilitate uh, HyFlex workshops offering face-to-face -face and video. And if you've got equipment already, that is great. Uh, if you don't, 
Um, I'll just go over quickly right now what we use that's relatively inexpensive, but works pretty well for us or quite well for us. So um, if the equipment already hasn't been purchased, here's a few things that work. Of course, a laptop is key or a podium computer if the space you, you have has it. Um, having an external camera is really important if you are using a laptop because the laptop cameras are great, but it's difficult to point them in the direction that uh, you want, especially if you're going to have it pointing at you during your introduction and then maybe towards the class to connect the online learners with the physical class. So having a, uh, uh, a USB camera that's on a little tripod so that you can point it in different directions is key. And it doesn't have to be expensive. You know, a 30 to $50 camera, just as long as it comes with a tripod, works uh, just fine. Uh, the other thing that's important is to have a wireless microphone. Um, we use the, what's it called? The Rode Wireless Go microphone. It's a little bit more expensive. It's more than the camera. It's about $250, but it is amazing quality. You can wander around the room. Um, yeah, it's, I can't recommend it high enough, the Rode Wireless Go. You do pay a little bit more for it, but it, it is great. And it's interesting, I come, I've done video conferencing in the past. Actually, when I worked for a manufacturing company in Calgary, I helped implement video conferencing equipment when they're using tele, digital telephone lines. And the key thing about video to remember is that people can deal with poor quality video. They do not deal well with poor quality audio. So make sure that your audio equipment is as, uh, as good as you can, uh, your budget can afford. And the Rode Wireless Go is great. Um, oh, last thing, I don't have a picture for it, but um, having a sound system available for the uh, local folks so that they can hear the remote people is important. If you've got a built-in sound system, great. If not, some large laptop or computer speakers would work just fine as well, and they're not that expensive. So every teaching method has strengths and weaknesses, and HyFlex is no different. Um, so I'm just going to go over some of the challenges that you should be aware of if you're thinking about trying to do this for a, a workshop or a class. So uh, there's an equity issue. Remote participants must have internet access and a computer to fully participate. And having a good internet connection is key. In my education class last week, we had a graduate student uh, lead the class on, um, on, actually it was on high flex, flip learning, different teaching modalities like that. She was connecting to us from Trinidad and Tobago, and her internet connection was not the best, unfortunately. And it was a little bit of a struggle uh, to hear everything she was saying, just because it would sort of cut in and out. She didn't have a great microphone either, which might have contributed to that problem. So having a good internet connection is important for you as the instructor, which shouldn't be an issue if you're on campus, but for your learners as well, that is important for them to have. Uh, have that. And that is one nice thing about HyFlex. If the con their connection isn't good, they can go to the self-paced materials uh, if necessary. Other thing would be uh, access to makerspace equipment is essential for some workshops. So there are a few workshops that we require people to come to the makerspace for. Um, so if they're going to be doing, uh, what would be a good example of that? Oh, for our Internet of Things workshop, uh, we couldn't find any virtual simulations for our Internet of Things electronics. So we actually didn't offer that at all during the pandemic. And then when we were back on campus, only face to face. We were able to do our Arduino workshop remotely because we found a good simulation tool. Uh, so we do offer that one in a high flex format. But uh, there are a number of, of things you really do need to, to be an active workshop anyways. You really do need to have hands on the equipment. So that is a drawback or a thing to keep in mind at least. The other thing to know is that it does take a fair bit of extra time to create high flex workshops. Uh, it's just a one-off um, you know, investment in time, but it, it, it can take a fair bit of time. The nice thing about the workshop format is that it is pretty self-contained so that I could do our 3D design and print workshop you know, teach it, play with that a little bit, and then move on to it if I'm happy with the results. Whereas with a semester long course, you might just do one class in a high flex format or one part of a class as you have time to invest in it and build up your expertise in 
designing, creating, and, and teaching HyFlex. And leading HyFlex workshops does require some practice. Um, I mentioned the cognitive load. Even with a TA, there is a little bit of extra cognitive load initially is until you can fully trust your TA to uh, you know, alert you when things need to taken care of in the virtual space while you're doing the instruction in particular. So if you are feeling the cognitive load is high or you're not sure, um, just remember it does take some practice. And if you'd like to, if you have any questions or would like to bounce ideas off people, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email address and contact info will be at the last slide here. Um, and I'll share these slides with you as well. But it does take practice. And as I mentioned before, teaching without a knowledgeable TA is really difficult. So, you know, when you start skiing, I wouldn't just go straight to the Black Diamond run. I'd, you know, start on the bunny hill first. It's that sort of a thing. It's possible, but it's, it's challenging. So just to wrap up, I'll just review some of the key things that are uh, that I think are important to take away. So the high flex format has been ex an excellent flame framework that's allowed our makerspace to transition from fully online uh, workshops during COVID to a hybrid face-to-face uh, -face online model now. HyFlex has allowed us to effectively and efficiently serve many learners who in the past just couldn't attend our workshops uh, due to sickness, family responsibilities, mental health, or just remote learners who aren't on campus. And pandemic or no pandemic, we're going to continue to offer our HyFlex workshops into the foreseeable future to better serve our campus community. And something I remembered this morning is I created a workshop. It was sort of internally called the Workshop Workshop for our graduate students. On Initially, it was for flipped uh, teaching methodology so they could learn how to teach as well as create flipped workshops. And we've updated it so it's a uh, quick primer on HyFlex. And I'll put that in the chat as well. It's also Creative Commons licensed. Um, so it's on GitHub, so you can make a copy of it uh, if you'd like, or just use it as is, of course. So that is the end of my sort of presentation, but I'd love to you know, hear your experiences or if you have questions uh, and my contact information is on the screen there as well. So um, yeah, so it's been wonderful to be here. I'll leave this up just for a minute so people can take down that info just in case they need it. But are there any questions? or comments. Thank you so much, Rich, um, for sharing your experience with us. Uh, and especially, uh, I, I made a note to ask you for the workshop workshop. So thank you so <laughs> much for, for sharing that openly with us. Um, I will say that I, I'm familiar with uh, how much sharing you do of, of the resources that you create in the workshops that you um, that you have. And so if uh, I, I noticed that we have Jessica from uh, University of Alberta Library with us today. Um, if if there are other folk, um, I highly recommend all the resources that Rich so openly shares. Um, we certainly, uh, in our makerspace, have, have used some of those resources and referenced them. So thank you for sharing. Um, are there any questions? There are only uh, 16 of us in the room, so I think we could probably um, maybe raise our hand. So if you're not familiar with uh, how the Google uh, slides, uh, the Google um, Meet is working. You'll see a little hand that looks like this. You can pop that up, and that will actually give us a queue of people who've uh, raised their hands in order. So then we're not talking over each other. But feel free to unmute, uh, unmute yourselves uh, to ask some questions of Rich. I will ask the first question if nobody else has, has got a question just yet. Um, oh, I see there's one from Jessica. She's asking for in-person 3D printing instruction, what is your ratio for participant to 3D printer? Um, it's probably since uh, since we've come back after the, uh, you know, post uh, lockdown, probably 70% are virtual and 30% are face-to-face. -face. So we've got five 3D printers, so pretty much one-to-one -one in terms of 3D printers. Um, we've got a, I'll put it up here. We've got a web interface for people to submit their jobs. So people typically aren't hands-on with the physical 3D printers to print, but um, 
Let me just see here. Oh, actually, you won't be able to see it because you've got to have a UVic login. But actually, this is open source software too um, that I can put a link to if you're interested for managing 3D print jobs. It hooks into our campus uh, authentication system. And then we've got Moneris for transactions. So we were able to outsource all that. So it's just managing print jobs. And students can manage their own print jobs, of course. And then there's an admin side for the, our staff to, to manage print jobs. But we obviously show them the printers, but we submit all of our printers over the network to them um, and have our uh, student assistants pulling jobs off and starting new ones. So does that answer your question, Jessica? Jessica, I'm curious. Are you uh, running a makerspace at the U of A? Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can. I thought it might be easier to come on chat. Um, yeah, in in a sense. So I coordinate our three D printing services through Cameron Library. That's all kind of mediated, uh, and then as well as the makerspace in our digital scholarship center. Although it's still uh, in its infancy, it was basically we were just starting to do uh, certification workshops to use the 3D printers in the makerspace mm. uh, before the pandemic. So yeah, since that, um, the makerspace hasn't really been functioning, especially because we were really just getting set up because it was, yeah, just it just opened essentially. So yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh yeah, our volume of 3D print was high enough. It was just convenient to be able to have a staff member manage jobs. So if it was a, you know, 12 hour job, that would uh, go on the printer end of day and the smaller jobs would sort of take place in the uh, during the day when someone was available to pull jobs on and off. So that's sort of the idea behind behind that. Yeah, I think I might need to start um, make a spreadsheet of everyone who has networked 3D printers because our IT is afraid to do that. <laughs> um, so yeah, we haven't been able to implement any kind of remote printing, which would be really nice. And it just seems like more and more people are doing that. And yeah. Well, if your IT folk, actually I'm formerly IT folk, so I can speak from experience here. If you're on the same sub what, or network or sort of if you're plugged into the same network hardware, you should be able to just connect to them from your computer in your office there. And then if you've got remote access software, you could connect from home to your you know, local workstation and print from there. It's a bit of a, a hack, but if the IT folks are too busy or a little bit afraid, that's one way to do it that wouldn't impact them, but get let you do your job too. Yeah, yeah, and they wanted us to state up front that that is not allowed, no one's allowed. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a bummer, but that's good. that's good to know. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Then we've got a question from Rebecca, uh, who doesn't have a mic. Uh, yep. I'm curious about using the makerspace to support English language training. Um, if you've run any workshops for non-native speakers. We have not directly, although uh, probably like Mount Royal, we do have a fair number of students who are coming from overseas who are still you know, working on their English language skills. So we indirectly do. Uh, and the flipped, using the flipped me methodology is really great for them. Actually, this is what I did my master's thesis on is flipped learning for information literacy instruction. And I did a mixed methodology. So I ended up interviewing a bunch of students. And one thing that came out of those interviews that I had no idea of is how much uh, English speakers or people who are learning to speak English love the flip methodology because a instruction that might be just me talking at my normal relatively slow speed might be really fast for someone who's just arrived in Canada and is still you know getting their English language skills up to speed so having videos that they can watch they can put on closed captioning which is helpful they can slow it down they can you know watch it multiple times so uh, yeah it's really easy and in any web browser now they can you know do a uh, Google Translate to whatever language. Um, it's not perfect, but it's actually not too bad. And if there are any pickups, they can all just put up their hand virtually or face to face and, and ask questions. Mm -hmm. I can speak for our makerspace. We have done some workshops um, specifically for our English learning um, courses on campus in the summer where students have come in. And it's really more about um, kind of 
learning some of the tools. So mostly they just did buttons and learn, learning to design for the buttons, but using that as a tool to talk about their experience of, of being in Calgary and being in um, out on campus. And so it's just like a different way to, to think about communication. So uh, yeah. we did that. Yeah. Actually, Rebecca, can I ask where you're from? Yeah. Actually, we did a workshop last summer. We were still in lockdown, but some of the people were on campus. It was our smartphone photography workshop. And they we changed it a little bit for them, but they would, part of the workshop, they'd go out and look for things. And, you know, okay, we're going to, you got 10 minutes to go take some pictures and then come back and shared them virtually. So it actually worked out quite well. Um, and tied in nicely to their English language skills program that they were taking at the time. That's great. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I'm curious, Rich, if you've got any spaces that are dead, that, that are, you know, um, you know, specialized learning classrooms or that kind of thing um, that you have access to that would facilitate high flex learning. So like, a, you know, a, a, a flexible classroom or any media walls or things like that. Yeah, no media walls, but we do have a our classroom here in the DSC sort of attached to the makerspace. It's everything is on wheels. We've got the big screen. We didn't have video built in, but the audio was built in. So we don't have, you know, the nice cameras that'll sort of move and track people as they speak. We've just got the little cheapo, you know, little camera that we can turn around and, uh, and it works, it works fine. And it was only like $30 or whatever. So it had the added virtue of not in, not in, uh, not having to talk to the IT folk and get budget room or anything like that. Our mm -hmm. admin just put it on her uh, corporate credit card and that was fine. Uh, but we did the wireless microphone. Again, I think she just put it on her credit card, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm a big believer in getting the job done. And sometimes the perfect solution might be a really late solution. So I'll go with an imperfect but workable one. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Janesta, I was w wondering if maybe you would want to speak to, if we've got some faculty in the room at Mount Royal, um, if you want to speak to some of the spaces, the Ideas Lounge, the Viz, Viz Classroom, and maybe even Christian speaking to some of the um, the classrooms that you have access to as well. It might be nice to just share some of those um, with the group. And also, I know, Jed, you've got at the U of C, there are some um, some spaces as well. It might be nice to just kind of share the different kinds of classroom setups mm -hmm. that might be uh, might be a, a good support for high flex learning. Yeah, I can I can start there. Thanks, Carrie. So um, at the library, we have two spaces which contain visualization walls. So one is called the visualization classroom. One is the ideas lounge. They're both um, very similar. One is a little bit larger, so the Ideas Lounge is a little bit larger, and one is a little bit more private. Um, so the Visualization Classroom has um, no glass walls and a proper door. It's more of um, a classroom, so you can have a private lecture in there a little bit easier. Um, but both of them have audio and video capacity built right in. So basically, you show up, log in um, to the Podium computer, um, and then it's going to connect to the cameras, it's going to connect to the microphones, and as long as you have the microphones turned on, then everyone should be able to see and hear you, um, just like you're opening up a Google Meet or a Skype call on your own laptop. So it enables um, some hybrid events, and we have had some in those spaces successfully. If anyone has questions, I can do my best to answer those. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Janesta. Christian, I wonder if you want to share the, the two classrooms that, that you have and, and even perhaps some of the other spaces that might support high flex learning. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks for a great presentation. Um, so we don't actually have rooms that are specifically set up with high flex in um, with full high flex capabilities, I will say that. We do have, so we have an active learning classroom and there is to some degree the opportunity for that in that space. We also have something called the Flexible Learning Lab, which um, 
which is an awesome space. Sometimes people just use it for video conferencing, but that is more set up as a as a high flex situation. Um, my and, and so on our team, we have educational technologists. We have people that are specialists in curriculum and pedagogy. We have people that are more dedicated to the technology, specifically ed tech. And um, the, the tech part of it, even so, so sorry. And when I say that room is fully enabled, I don't mean that there's actually like eyes or tracking in it. It's like it's, it's stable. My interest is in exploring really um, the and sorry, this isn't very well articulated, but the um, we we have a lot of faculty. If I can disclose, I just I'm looking at that record button, so I'm just being very. <laughs> I'm, thinking, I'm thinking about like the um, you know the 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 pedagogy of it, not so much the technical elements of it. Um, that I I feel like I feel like it's a lot for faculty to take on. Um, in so far as you know, planning and what to have available in the classroom, and how to um, you know how to really um, leverage the people that are outside of the room, right? Um, I know that we've had some limited success in things like labs um, that we were forced to do in that way. Um, mind you, those weren't really truly high flex, right? Um, but it's um, yeah, for for me, it's more the pedagogical end of things and the really the feasibility of this. I mean, like we we love the idea. But when we think about the the implementation of it, um, as an example, we're a primarily undergraduate institution, so we don't have teaching assistants, as an example. And so when we think about, um, and that's like that's in in the grading. That's and I, I I like what you said about you know deputizing a student maybe to monitor the chat or something like that. But I think that some of these other pieces that our faculty would need support with are beyond what we can impose on a on a tuition paying student. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so so those are those are just things I kind of grapple around that, you know, ideologically, I love it. Um, in the practicality of actually implementing this, um, I, I continue to uh, explore and discuss as we say in HR. Yeah. So I'll put in the chat a link to my my high flex education class this Friday, just to get a sense of what it would look like for the learner who's so there is one student that I know has a doctor's appointment. She can't yeah. make it to class physically or virtually via Zoom. So she'll just be working through that this week. And the experience will be a little bit different for her, of course. Uh, and I'm teaching pre-service teachers. So they're all, mm. uh, you know, into pedagogy and thinking about it. And one of the things that I've really had to emphasize uh, in the class is that this is my fifth time teaching this class. And the first one looked nothing like this. Right. And when you get out to teach in their elementary education, um, you know, your first time is not going to be perfect. You're not going to have the things built up. You're not going to have the time to build it up. Um, so be gentle with yourself and have a plan maybe to do something like that. But it isn't going to happen at once. And the same thing I'm sure could be said for most instructors who are teaching in a basically a lecture style format now you know maybe learning to a flipped methodology or a lecture or two to a flip methodology initially and then maybe morphing to hybrid eventually or high flex eventually but mm -hmm. it is i've got a well i don't promote this but I, I like to say it's the pedagogy stupid i teach an ed tech class but make it clear that it really is the pedagogy that's important and the that's right ed tech yeah. tools are in the service of enabling pedagogies yeah. that maybe aren't available uh, with traditional methods. Yeah, and I and I do wish that we had a better. And by we, I mean like with, within within the ADC here, uh, a more uh, full response to questions around this, which is why I'm seeking to learn more. Um, you know, I, I know that we do have some some faculty members who are who have kind of. Um, I call it like MacGyvering something together. So they kind of, they like, they have an iPad and then they, you know, they've, they've got this like, <laughs> like super industrial Velcro thing and they sort of snuck one on the side of the podium and they're just kind of stitching it together. Um, and they're super, super, super invested. Um, and I love that. Uh, it's, it's difficult to make that ask of all. But yes. then I think about, you know, institutionally, and I'm sure that this is the same for people from a number of other um, 
uh, PSIs, but you know the, the the message from the institution has been: if you are unwell, you know, stay home. And we mm -hmm. do we need to do that. And hopefully, as a society, we get better at that. Mm -hmm. um, but there there we can't say that and then have a negative consequence to complying with that, which is yeah. that you know I missed the lecture, I missed the quiz, I missed the whatever. So it's I don't know. We're in interesting times. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I. There's three three classes, uh, three sections of the class that I'm teaching. I'm only teaching one section. I know some of the other instructors have actually pointed people to my weekly uh, posts. Just mm -hmm. they're they're outside of the LMS, so they're freely available to anyone anywhere. So they'll just say, "Oh, you can't." Well, just work through. You know, uh, I'm not a doctor, but everyone calls me Doctor McHugh for some reason. Anyways, <laughs> you know, go to Rich's post and. Uh, just work through that this week and then we'll you know, reconnect when you're feeling better or do it when you're feeling better and then we'll reconnect when you're back. But. That's right. And I, and I think, I mean, if there, if there are any, always looking for a silver lining, kind of tough with the global pandemic, but I think mm -hmm. about just the amount of um, the advancements that we've made with technology and, and the willingness of people to share information like such as what you're sharing that I just go, oh my goodness, we can't, we can't all be reinventing wheels all over the place. So it's just, it's immensely helpful. And I think that lots of times it's like, well, maybe I'm not going to take that wholesale and I'll take a bit of what Rich said, and then I'm going to take a bit of what Carrie said. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to make it in the MRU context, you know? So it's, it's, these are great conversations. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that generosity of sharing um, awesome. is, is really valuable. Yeah, really, really valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get as much as I give. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's nice. It's nice to be able to share. Yeah. It is a bit of an ethos too with the maker community as well, yeah. right? So, yeah. Well, li libraries are kind of into sharing too. They I like are. to tell people we're good socialists. We, <laughs> give, we give a lot away. Yes, yeah. Um, I, I know that there's lots of other people in the room, so I just wanted to open up and see if there are any other questions or comments that people or things people would like to share from their own experiences. Jed, can I ask you how things have been over at the University of Calgary? Well, you can ask. <laughs> um, I think we're about to go into another transitional period here, starting in the summer. So that's yeah. a little stressful. Uh, we've had a lot, like possibly more than we've ever had, uh, use for our makerspace as well as our 3D print service, which um, is both amazing and also overwhelming. I think um, like one of the nice arguably nice things, um, at least for our students, is most of the faculties have access to their own maker spaces and their own 3D printers. Mm -hmm. So we're more like a, a hub for everyone, but then they also often just congregate within their faculties. And engineering has 60 3D printers, and we're still getting droves of engineering students right now. So I think just as final projects are due, um, there's a lot of demand. Um, we did give some really great workshops, but because of COVID and everything else, I have like a full, um, completely fresh roster of students who are, uh, all of our workshops are normally delivered, like developed and delivered by our student staff. So we didn't really get anything done, uh, during the, the fall semester, but winter semester, we had some really good workshops, mm -hmm. um, to speak to. Uh, 3D printing over the network. Uh, my experience has been that we get a lot of failures when we're using USB cables, um, largely just because if the computer that's like pushing that data gets like a Windows update or anything that causes even the most remote hiccup on that USB cable, then your whole print fails. So that's why we choose not to do network printing. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be possible, again, you'd probably have to get IT's buy-in, uh, Jessica, but you'd have to have it ideally, if not isolated from the domain. Um, it would just have to be kind of in a special group so that it's not getting, it's not suffering any unanticipated performance hits because that will 
especially if you have several printers networked together, that'll cause multiple print failures um, in my experience. Mm. Jed, how are they doing it in engineering in that room where they've got the, the 60? Um, I actually, I do think they're doing networking there, but I don't know how they managed to to leverage that with uh, um, IT. Mm. Um, it also, it does really depend on the type of printer you have as well, because some will buffer now, so like it's not as vulnerable to the USB thing, but the, uh -huh. the ones we had were ones that were recommended by uh, Hunt, um, NCSU, Hunt's Makerspace in North Carolina. Mm. And they were great, they were fast, but they definitely were vulnerable to the, the USB stability issue. Right. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Jed, are people using your media walls for any kind of high flex type of uh, situations for teaching and learning? Um, well, not the media walls because those are those are more like our signage in the building. But the visualization room, I think mm -hmm. I think That's John's actually off. here. He could probably speak to that if he's willing. He's the one who manages the space, so I think he'd have a better idea. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, because our Viz Studio is so small, it's 20 feet by 20 feet. Um, really, there's been no in person yet, um, just with COVID concerns. Um, we're hoping to get a bit of that happening, but um, a lot. I think a lot of our faculty still really are just focusing on getting the semester all wrapped up before they start engaging in new things. And so we're just kind of waiting for that that relaxation to happen uh, to, to get some of that going. Yeah, that's fair. It's been quite a semester and quite an academic year this year. I think it's, I think it's really interesting to think about the technologies that were in place. You know, I'm familiar with the technologies that were in place at, at the U of C, C and University of Calgary and the technologies that we've had in place um, in our building, whether it's ADC's technology and, and, um, and unique classroom spaces uh, or the learning spaces that we have in our library. I think it's interesting that those places and those spaces have were, were put in place um, but now with our with our new thinking, Rich, that like you've shared with us today, we can now really think about uh, new opportunities for engaging those spaces and those technologies that we have that are really meaningful for students and for faculty who are teaching um, in spaces that that we have to have that flexibility. Um, and I think that where we've all gotten used to it, we're at we're at a point where we really want to explore that. Um, because I think students have found found places that they enjoy it. I think faculty have found ways that they enjoy it. Even though we were forced into it, I think it's moved us ahead in, in lots of really interesting ways, which I think you, you've really highlighted. And I'm, I'm so grateful that you could share that data that you've been able to gather from your experiences, Rich. We've just got three minutes left, so I just wanted to open up to the floor if there are any last questions or comments for Rich. Well, people think about a potential question. I've been interviewing students in my education class this week, just sort of end of semester interviews. And the last question I have for them is, you know, what are two things that work particularly well for you about the class, whether it be a topic or a teaching method, and what's one thing you would change? And probably 80% of them say that the high flex format was great in reducing their anxiety because mm. they know they had that backstop if things went sideways with COVID or family member being ill or whatever. Um, so that was nice uh, anecdotal, but I've got 30 students in my class and I've interviewed 20 of them so far. So it's mm. a pretty, pretty broad, broad base. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I see the difference in in our space with even just students emailing like that. That kind of the way that they're connecting with us is 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 different to the way that they did before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're in a new in a new world, which is exciting. Um, so we'll get to see where it goes. Uh, thank you so much, Rich, for joining us today. I really really appreciate it. Um, it's always always a joy to hear what you're doing at the University of Victoria because you're always doing really interesting stuff and the expertise that you bring um, to the, the Makerspace 
realm, let's say, in, uh, in, in post-secondary is really valuable to, to moving us all forward and for you sharing all of your knowledge. We're really grateful for that.